of electrophoresis techniques specified on uh, proteins. And the reason why we have selected this uh, for today is that um, we found it very useful uh, to know about the basics, what happens during electrophoresis, um, as uh, this can help you to find the reasons for things which don't work as expected in your practical work in the lab. Um, I go right into the subject and then the first um, picture you see an overview over the typical four different uh, electrophoresis techniques which are used for proteins um, and uh, I just uh, explain them very briefly. Uh, there is zone electrophoresis or some people call it only electrophoresis where you can separate a mixture of charged particles, molecules, uh, peptides, uh, proteins and in most cases you are using a high pH, basic buffer uh, system which um, is the reason for negative net charges on the molecules. So in an electric field they will start to migrate uh, towards the anode uh, in some cases you have um, just a um, uh, uh, liquid um, medium, just a buffer like in capillaries or free flow electrophoresis you have a buffer uh, layer or you are using gels like agarose or polyacrylamide gels and you use gels, uh, the uh, gel matrix um, uh, is um, reason for retardation for sieving of the molecules, uh, so the size of the molecules will also play a role, not only the charge. And in this way uh, you see that uh, some, the smaller, higher charge will migrate faster than the larger, lower charge, and you get a separation into distinct zones, that's why it's called zone uh, electrophoresis. The second is the moving boundary electrophoresis. I don't want to explain it too much in detail, but Actually, this was the first electrophoresis techniques um, um, used by Arnett Celius, who invented electrophoresis, and he used a U um, tube uh, filled with um, buffer and has applied a protein mixture at the bottom, and then the positively charged start to migrate towards the cathode, the negatively charged uh, towards the anode. But unfortunately, what you get here are mixed zones. So you only the first two in the front are clean zones, the others are mixed of different uh, ions and uh, but you can find uh, with Schlieren optics the, uh, the boundaries between the zones and they can be visualized and uh, so you can see something like the separation. But the resolution is not very high as you can see and uh, not very uh, long later after this uh, it has been realized that zone electrophoresis is much easier than moving boundary electrophoresis and so it has been more or less abandoned. But uh, you should have heard about it. A third I believe is an important um, technology uh, or method is isotachophoresis. I will explain that all more in detail later on, but isotachophoresis is a Greek word, means migration with the same speed, iso the same, tacho the speed and phoresis uh, the migration. And um, in this technique you achieve uh, the migration of all the different ions with exactly the same speed. Why you do this and how that works, I will explain that uh, later on, because this is the basics for understanding a few techniques which you are my, maybe daily using in your lab. And the fourth is isoelectric focusing, which can only exclusively be done with amphoteric compounds like proteins and peptides, but it's such an important technique, we will uh, have an extra webinar on the 20th of November. Uh, please mark this in your calendar, then we talk about the isoelectric focusing basics and some applications. Okay, let's talk about uh, zone and uh, electrophoresis and isotachophoresis. Um, so how in practice uh, will you run uh, your electrophoresis? Now for proteins, and the reason for this I will tell you a little bit later, mainly polyacrylamide gels are applied, uh, not so much agarose anymore. And you have several possibilities, geometric possibilities, how to 
run these gels. For instance, let's start here on the left side in vertical systems. So in the beginning, people were using glass tubes and they polymerized the polyacrylamide rod in those and there the sample was applied. We had an upper buffer tank, a lower buffer tank, there were the electrodes and you had a migration from the top to the bottom according to the electrophoretic mobilities of the proteins, the charged proteins. Now this technique looks very nice but it has some methodical limitations, um, these um, gel rods are not so easy to handle, to stain, to compare, so that's and uh, is why people switched over in most cases to use slab gels. The slab gels are between two glass plates for instance and you can cast them in your lab and you uh, produce the sample application pot pockets by inserting something like a comb into the uh, mold during polymerization and uh, then you have these little uh, gel pockets. And you have also here an upper and a lower buffer tank and uh, run this sample from top to the bottom. Now there is one thing which happens in slab gels very easily, this so-called smiling effect. Why does that happen? Now electrophoresis is one of the electric methods, like all electrophoretic methods, you are producing also heat with them, the so-called Joule heat. So think about an electric uh, motor, electromotor, or think about a um, uh, bulb, uh, light bulb. You know, part of the energy um, is always um, lost by the heat, also in electrophoresis. Now the heat produced in the gel is um, higher in the center than in the two uh, lateral sides because in the two lateral sides the temperature uh, has a possibility to uh, be uh, to, to 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 uh, be removed into the uh, lateral sides more efficiently than in the center. That means temperature is higher in the center than in the two lateral sides, and that causes a faster migration, a higher electrophoretic mobility of the particles in the center than in the two lateral sides and this is causing the so-called smiling effects. What you want to have in reality is an even distribution, an even uh, front to com compare the samples uh, more accurately. Uh, what can you do against it? So people try to uh, place the instrument into a cooling room or into a, in a cold room or a refrigerator, but air is a very bad um, temperature conductor, so it's better to use other tricks. For instance, uh, people were increasing the so-called upper buffer, making it larger and using it as, as a uh, temperature sink, so you had a better uh, distrib uh, removal of the temperature, even more even distribution of the temperature. You could also use a heat exchanger to cool this upper buffer and cool the gel with it. But uh, there are cases where people have um, found um, a very interesting effect which is called Venetian blind effect uh, that you get a faster migration of the proteins in the front side of the gel than in the back side. And that can come when you apply too much um, power on the system, then you can cool the gel more efficiently from the back than in the front and that uh, is uneven um, migration uh, of proteins uh, in the gel and when you for instance use silver staining which preferably stains in the surfaces then you can uh, create double bands with it. So another type of construction is using a large lower buffer tank, um, usually the anodal buffer and uh, there you cool, you have also a heat exchanger cooling the buffer, the buffer cools the glass plates and the glass plates cool the gels. Now all these vertical systems have one thing in common that you are separating your samples in closed systems. So these are closed gels are closed in glass or other or plastic and there is uh, nothing exposed uh, to the air. Um, the horizontal systems have been started uh, to be developed at the same time like the vertical systems and here the gels are used with an open surface. Typically uh, gels are placed on a cooling plate and so you are not cooling via the buffer like in a vertical system but directly on the gel. 
you can use that for zone electrophoresis with the buffer tanks, but particularly isoelectric focusing is a method uh, which is used in horizontal uh, systems very successful. Here you, are, you don't need electrode buffers. And, but we will talk about this in a few months later. Uh, you can also here modify the way how to have the buffer the, of the construction of the buffer reservoir. You can use liquid tanks, uh, but you can also uh, cast polyacrylamide gels or agarose gel strips containing the buffer in high concentration. Or even e uh, easier, you can soak fabric wicks uh, fleece material in uh, the buffer concentrate and apply them on the lateral sides of the gels. You can also here achieve um, small slots for applying the sample uh, with the mold you cast uh, the gel. All this can exist in different sizes from very small like in a fast system to very large uh, uh, gels. Now what gels are mainly used in um, uh, protein electrophoresis. Uh, formerly people used more agarose, but I would say the major applications are all done in polyacrylamide gels because they are chemically and electrochemically completely in or almost completely inert and they are perfectly transparent, they are highly elastic and uh, all this is not the case uh, for agarose gels. Agarose gels have one benefit over polyacrylamides that they have larger pore sizes and uh, so they can be used for large molecules um, but polyacrylamide gels uh, are better suited for protein uh, separations as they are uh, relatively small and you can modify the uh, buffer, uh, the, uh, the, the gel pores uh, by modifying the total acrylamide concentration and the cross-linking factor. And with, for instance, one definition here that would be a quite open gel with la relatively large pore sizes, with 5% T and 3% C you would achieve a pore size diameter of about 5 nanometer. Compare this with agarose gels, typical 1% agarose, these have much lar larger diameters. No. Yeah, a uh, few words, uh, you will hear a little bit more why agarose uh, gels are not used in uh, protein electrophoresis a little bit later. Now uh, to the uh, principle of electrophoresis in general and zone electrophoresis. Just take a particle, a protein, a nucleic acid or what have you and uh, put it into let's say a buffer with a high pH, a basic pH. So the molecule will be negatively charged in an electric field, the negatively charged molecule will be attracted by the anode so it will start to migrate with a distinct speed. And this is the only equation you should remember this is the speed of the particle is equal uh, to the product of the electrophoretic mobility. You see this is a quite complex um, uh, factor and I will explain a little bit more on this parameter times uh, or multiplied with electric field strength. The electric field strength E is measured with volt per centimeter and this is important to know so you are not using the voltage uh, here in the formula because a protein or a particle in a gel does not know how long is the gel. So it's the volt per centimeter, the electric field which is um, moving the molecules forward. A few words on the electrophoretic mobility. So there are several parameters defining the electrophoretic mobility. First of all, there are parameters which are acting on every cell every molecule uh, because they are coming from the system. So for instance the sieving properties of the gel, uh, defined by the gel pore sizes and then the buffer you are using, the pH value, the ionic strength, the conductivity of the buffer, also the viscosity because you can put additives into the buffer like um, um, monoethylene glycol or sorbitol and then you reduce the electrophoretic mobility because you have a higher friction. And the temperature, we have talked about this already, the higher the temperature, the higher the mobility. 
but there are the factors which are different from uh, uh, component to component, the charges and the sizes of the molecules. And uh, this is causing a separation because here are the differences in electrophoretic mobility uh, between the sample uh, components. Uh, another thing is important to know, so the voltage you apply depends on the separation distance, on the distance between the electrodes. So in order to achieve a certain volt per centimeter, uh, you have to apply a higher voltage if you use large gels and a lower voltage if you use short, small gels. And you have the current flow, and the current flow is proportional to the cross-section of the gel, thicker and wider gel, you have a higher current flow uh, than a thin and narrow gel. And you should always remember uh, the product of voltage times the current is giving you the power. And the power you apply on a gel, this one is responsible for the joule heat. So the higher the power, the more danger it, uh, there is there to, to have a relatively high joule heat and these heat effects, this uh, smiling effect, uh, for instance, or overheating of the system. So you should be able to reduce the power by reducing the current or you, re, or you, you limit the voltage or the best you could do if you have a power supply uh, which has this facility to uh, also um, limit the power that you cannot uh, exceed a certain power limit uh, in order not to overheat the system. Another thing you should know is what is electroendosmosis. I try to explain it very shortly to you. So what you should see here is a gel matrix and glass plates is often a combination of gel and glass used in electrophoresis and you have the electrophoretic migration uh, according to the charge and the size in this uh, matrix as uh, already applied, uh, um, explained earlier. Um, but uh, the world is not perfect, as you know, and um, so the matrix is not always completely inert. For instance, glass surfaces are never inert, electrically inert, because glass contains silicium oxide, and on the surface, uh, so you have charged groups there. And also the gels are not completely inert. For instance, an agarose gel contains a high uh, amount of leftovers uh, from, um, from agaropectin, from, because it's uh, coming from the agar-agar, um, and um, you cannot completely, 100% uh, remove the agaropectin. And this can leave uh, carboxylic groups and sulfonic groups in the matrix or polyacrylamide gels. If you make a polyacrylamide gels with uh, bad quality reagents, uh, for instance, your acrylamide solutions is old or the acrylamide is a cheap, uh, not very pure stuff, you have um, um, acrylic acid there and acrylic acid will participate in the polymerization of a polyacrylamide gel and then all together when you use a basic buffer system, a high pH, silicium oxide, carboxylic sulfonic groups will all become negatively charged because they will become deprotonated and so you have now fixed negative charges attracted by the anode. Now, they of course would like to migrate towards the anode but they can't because they are part of the, uh, of the system, of the uh, stabilizing system. So you will achieve uh, a counter-reaction. And the counter-reaction is a migration of protonated water molecules into the opposite direction, into the cathode direction. And as you see this animation here, this water flow is also called the electroosmotic flow, or this is called electroendosmosis, is flowing against the migration uh, of the uh, separation. And that is causing blurred man's and unsharp uh, results and other effects which can be very nasty. So usually, usually electroendosmosis can be uh, very uh, nasty and uh, particularly agarose gels are dangerous here. Now agarose gels are perfectly suited for large DNA molecule separation but for proteins uh, 
they are have too high uh, electroendosmosis and too high pore diameters, um, so you get a lot of diffusion and diffuse bands. That's one of the reasons why people prefer polyacrylamide gels in uh, protein electrophoresis. Okay, so I repeat, the sound electrophoresis um, basics is very simple to understand. You get a separation according to the elect different electrophoretic mobilities of the sample components uh, which are producing sounds and this is a separation parameter. There is the other technique which is a little bit more complicated, uh, isotachophoresis. I said already that this is an electrophoresis method where all the ions migrate with exactly the same speed. How can you achieve that and what uh, does it help you? Why will you do the, what you do as a is? I will explain a little bit later. First, I want to explain you how it works. So, in order to make isotachophoresis happen, you need a discontinuous buffer system. So, instead of having the same ions in, uh, all across the system, you are dividing the systems in some areas. So, for instance, in the gel, you can have, uh, um, so you will have uh, the Tris counter ion, for instance, basic counter ion in everywhere. But in uh, the anions, you can divide the areas. So uh, you can, for instance, use a leading ion like chloride. Chloride or acetate or phosphoric acid are very small molecules, highly mobile because they are highly charged, and uh, so they are uh, ions with high mobility. And the second trick you are titrating this area, the tris chloride, to a certain pH, pH 6.8. Now, then you can use as a trailing ion glycine. A trailing ion should be an ion with a very low mobility. And when you have, have a pH of 6.8, glycine, amphoteric compound, have, would have a very low uh, mobility because this is very close to the isoelectric point of the glycine. Now, in between the area uh, of the tris chloride with the high mobility and the tris glycine, you apply your sample mixture with their mobilities between the very high mobility and the very low mobility extreme. And when you now switch on the electric field, you uh, will have the effect that all the anions will start to migrate towards the anode but all of them with the same speed. Now, first of all, you would not believe why the same speed, because they have different mobilities. But if the leading ion, the chloride, for instance, would run away according its high mobility, it would leave an ion gap between the samples and itself, and that would mean there is an interruption of the electric field. So it cannot happen. Ion gap cannot happen, so you force the chloride to migrate much, much slower than it would like to do. On the other side, the glycine would prefer to stay in the upper buffer tank, but you force the glycine to migrate with the samples because otherwise it would leave an ion gap behind the samples. So the glycine is forced to migrate uh, with the uh, uh, same speed, otherwise the electric field would be interrupted. Yeah, and um, now this is causing uh, separation of the samples. Now, why would this cause a uh, um, uh, separation of the sample and the zone sharpening effect? I will uh, go back to the principle of electrophoresis. Remember this only equation you should uh, remember, uh, the speed. So, if all the molecules migrate with the same speed, but the molecules have different electrophoretic mobility, Automatically, the area where the molecules are must have different electric field strengths. So, in the area of high mobility, the field strengths must be automatically very low. In the area of low mobility, of the glycine area, automatically the field strengths must be very high according to this equation. So, again, you have ion migration with the same speed. And during this migration, you will get field strength steps, high 
uh, high field strengths here, low field strengths here. This is causing a regulation effect and you will get a separation according to the mobilities because uh, if an ion stays back, uh, is getting slower than it should according to its mobility, it will be pushed forward by the high field strengths. And if one is migrating too fast, it will go come into the area of low field strengths, that means it will be rotate, retarded, it will become slower again. And this will also happen between the different sample components and that means that you get distinct zones uh, following each other in the sequence of their mobility. The small, uh, highly charged uh, in the front and the large, lower charge in the back. And this is causing you uh, separation. And this has a zone sharpening effect as well. As the higher concentration of the leading ion, the higher the sh uh, concentration of the zones will be and that will give you very sharp zones. Now isotachophoresis is working against diffusion and this is the reason why it's preferred, preferably used in uh, gel-free systems like in capillaries, in free flow electrophoresis because there you have no gels with uh, a sieving effect uh, to work against uh, diffusion. But uh, isotachophoresis is also very useful in gel electrophoresis. And here in most of the, its uh, applications are in the so-called disk continuous electrophoresis, disk electrophoresis. This method was introduced in the year 1964 by Ornstein and Davis, we can say invented by them. And this is a combination of isotachophoresis and zone electrophoresis. And uh, first, uh, why ha did it have to be developed? In the years before 1964, people mainly used agarose and, um, and um, uh, starch gel electrophoresis, which have uh, much larger pore sizes than polyacrylamide gels. But with the introduction of polyacrylamide gels, which has all these benefits I have already uh, talked about, uh, you get a very strong sieving of the gel. Now when you have a very basic buffer system like a tris glycine buffer pH 9.5 or 9, and you apply the sample, the sample, the proteins will have in the gel, in the pockets where there is no sieving, a very high mobility. So the proteins will start to migrate to the anode very, very quickly, but then they have to enter the narrow pore size of the gel. And this is causing a sudden um, slowdown of the molecules and this is causing an aggregation, an up con highly concentrated uh, up concentration and aggregation of the proteins that will not go properly into the gel. You have some smearing and not a uh, appropriate separation. In this electrophoresis, you are uh, doing the following. You cast a low, uh, small pore size resolving gel with a tris chloride pH 8.8 .8 and, and the T uh, value, for instance, uh, sorry. So, and uh, on top of this, you are casting a uh, stacking gel with large uh, pore sizes and the tris chloride buffer pH 6.8 um, with a, a lower uh, concentration. The, you remember the famous pH 6.8, you need to make the glycine a slow uh, migrating ion. And uh, uh, in the upper buffer, you are using the tri tris glycine, but only the tris glycine, nothing else there. So when you apply the electric field, you, and I forgot to say one thing, in um, isotachophoresis, you can control the speed of the migration. You usually have a very slow migration. So the sample will very carefully, very slowly uh, go into the large pore size uh, stacking gel. And here, uh, the isotachophoresis, isotachophoresis will uh, be um, the separation factor and when the uh, bands, the first protein band will arrive at the narrow pore size uh, resolving gel, then suddenly the conditions will change. So the proteins will become much slower because of the sieving effect, 
But this is not the case for the glycine. So the glycine will uh, not be become slower. It will overtake the uh, the protein bands, and suddenly it will arrive at pH 8.8. .8. That means glycine will be highly charged, and um, and this means it will start to migrate much much faster. And suddenly the glycine is the buffering component. So the buffer pH will even go higher to up to pH 9.5. So that means that suddenly the proteins are no longer in a discontinuous system. They are in a homogeneous buffer and they will destack and suddenly separate and migrate with different migration speed and separate according uh, to the um, uh, electrophoretic mobilities. And here on the right you could always watch this in this animation how that uh, system works. SDS electrophoresis is a special application. Here you uh, cover the uh, polypeptide chains with an anionic detergent, the sodium dodecyl sulfate, in order to mask the different charges. And then you uh, will also denature your uh, uh, tertiary and secondary structures, so the molecules will be stretched out and will be um, sieved according to their size. Uh, so here is the native condition. Is the SDS will sit on the surface like on a necklace structure and will stretch out the polypeptide chains. But it cannot completely stretch them out because you still have the disulfid bonds which cannot be opened by the SDS, but by uh, treatment uh, with additionally a reductant like DTT or beta mercaptoethanol. Um, uh, you open up the disulfid uh, bonds and then uh, you get a, um, a stretching, complete uh, stretching. But you pay for it with the destroyment of the uh, quaternary structure. You see only the subunits and not the complete uh, quaternary structures. And in order to avoid backfolding and uh, building of aggregates between uh, not perfectly protected uh, SH groups, you should alkylate uh, your uh, sample after this, either with iodoacetamide or with vinylperidine. And then you avoid artifacts by backfolding, uh, blurring of bands, and uh, building of um, artifactual uh, tertiary uh, new quaternary structures. So the famous Lemley gel, so Lemley system, which uh, is uh, used by many, many uh, people. Uh, Professor Lemley has combined the SDS electrophoresis with the disk electrophoresis according to Ornstein and Davis, and that works uh, very nicely uh, for and gives very sharp zones. But here, this is an example uh, where it is important that you have understood the isotachophoresis step of the discontinuous electrophoresis because they, there are this, uh, very often uh, happening mistake in some labs is that the people try to titrate uh, the pH of the trees glycine SDS buffer to a pH of 8.4 which is unfortunately um, written in some protocols which have been um, used in the labs over the many years so now having understood uh, what happens here, you can imagine that this will uh, not work very well. First of all, if you have chloride also in the upper buffer, you have first a phase where all the chloride has to move out of the upper buffer before the proteins can start to migrate. So that takes a very long separation time. And then secondly, the stacking effect will not work anymore. And so the band, the performance of the separation is uh, very, uh, bad is much uh, worse than if you do that uh, correctly. So you, this is a typical example of uh, how to under, uh, that you understand uh, what happens in disk electrophoresis to do that right. Now uh, when you plot the logarithms of the molecular weights um, over the relative mobility, the relative mobility is measured versus the mobility of the FAD mar uh, the, the marker, the dye marker, um, usually uh, bromophenol blue, then you will get a sigmoidal 
shaped curve, and in some area, in the major area, you have a linear re relation, and there you can uh, interpolate the molecular sizes. It's better to say molecular sizes than molecular weights, because molecular weights you can really only measure uh, with mass spectrometry, and in um, SDS electrophoresis is more an estimate. Uh, by selecting different gels, you can get selectivity curves, so you can spread optimally where you want to have your optimal separation. So these are different gel types, 8% T, 10% T, 12, 14%, and there you see where in which area or uh, logarithm of molecular weight you get the best resolution. Um, gradient gels are much less selective as you see, uh, they have much flatter uh, selectivity curves, but they have usually a wider um, separation range, and um, so you can select what gel would be the optimum for your analysis. In order to inter uh, be able to interpolate the molecular size, usually you use molecular weight markers or molecular size markers in better. And here you see the portfolio of uh, server has non-stained markers and has pre-stain markers, so you can watch already during the separation how it uh, uh, develops, and what is not shown here, because you can uh, visualize that easily, you can also do uh, fluorescent uh, labeled uh, markers here. The dual color means that you, uh, they are also dyed and fluorescent at the same time. Here you see, uh, yeah, uh, quick a quick um, uh, movie of a separation so this is a real horizontal SDS electrophoresis but in um, uh, sh short uh, running time and uh, in reality it takes much longer of course and here you see how the pattern uh, develops during the separation uh, so Sava has both um, they have vertical systems and vertical ready-made gels and they have uh, uh, horizontal gels. And the horizontal gels, for instance, you run on a cooling plate here in this drawer, there's a cooling plate and uh, there is a power supply and you need also a cooling machine which is not shown on the picture uh, to run these gels. Here you are using uh, soaked uh, um, uh, strips um, of uh, fleece material with the buffer, no, no buffer tanks anymore, makes life much easier. Here you see one example of an SDS gel stained with Kumasi Blue, it's a 10% gel with 25 uh, sample uh, slots. This gel, this system is very well suited also for uh, native electrophoresis, for two-dimensional electrophoresis, but also particularly for isoelectric focusing, but there will be a separate webinar in November 20th and please note this in your calendar, then I will explain that a little bit more in detail. For vertical gels, we have even more different systems. There's, for instance, the small one, uh, the vertical prime electrophoresis unit, quite new development. Um, uh, here, it's very easy to apply the ready-made gels in plastic cassettes and snap them uh, into the core of the system, and you can uh, run them very, very easily without any screws and other uh, separate parts. Uh, they are perfectly uh, running the systems with uh, the um, gel portfolio, we call it the prime, the premium resolution in mini gel electrophoresis, and here you see a very wide gradient, 4 to 20, with an extremely high resolution and reaching down to even uh, lower than 3 kilodalton. Uh, the reason, so this is uh, actually, this is a Dries glycine buffer system uh, with Dries chloride uh, as a leading ion and we had mo manipulated the buffer system in a way that the gels have a long time uh, storage stability. Um, usually the, there is a limitation of um, stability of uh, these SDS gels because they have a gel buffer with a pH 8.8 which causes alkaline hydrolysis but this uh, here uh, have a pH below 7 and so they are not uh, degrading and uh, you see the performance is very nice. 
the gels themselves do not contain SDS, so you can use them also by just applying a different buffer uh, as a native separation um, as well. Uh, for larger gels, there is also uh, the Hilfe uh, program in uh, Serva available. Uh, the standard SE600 and 660 chambers with uh, like four, uh, 16 times 16 centimeter gels. Uh, this is practically the same instrument like this, just looks a little bit nicer and costs a little bit more, <laughs> I think, I'm not sure. And for very large gels, 25 times uh, 20 centimeters, for, but exclusively for 2D electrophoresis, there is also the SE900. Uh, in the end, I will just also make a few marks on alternatives. So, when you, for instance, run native electrophoresis, um, you have a limitation in disk electrophoresis. If the isoelectric point of a protein is higher than 6.8, it will not go into the gels. So, you have to uh, try uh, to a, a different buffer system, for instance, an acidic buffer system. And here, is a paper on making special disk on electrophoresis uh, buffers for um, acidic electrophoresis. And acidic electrophoresis uh, can be very useful, particularly when you want to um, separate membrane glycoproteins, which are very hydrophobic. They separate much better uh, in an acidic buffer system and they are positively charged than in a um, uh, in a, uh, then in a basic buffer system and they are negatively charged. These are two papers which might be important here. And the last I want to introduce is the Blue Native page. In Blue Native electrophoresis, you are not separating proteins. Here you are separating intact protein complexes, so much bigger com uh, particles. And the method has been invented by Schäger and von Jagoff already quite a few years ago, 1991. And what you do here is you are extracting your intact uh, um, complexes and you add Kumasi dye. The Kumasi dye, which is usually used for staining after separation, uh, is an anionic dye which sticks to hydrophobic surfaces. So you can uh, convert uh, um, a complex with, with any isoelectric point to an acidic uh, to a negatively charged uh, um, a particle, and uh, you also play, put some blue native, uh, some Kumasi uh, blue in the upper buffer, and you apply the sample on a porosity gradient gel at the cold temperature, the neutral buffer system, and in this way you are separating complexes instead of proteins. You can see the blue complexes in the gel, you can cut them out and uh, further analyze uh, them. Here you see uh, uh, some bands of complexes uh, still having the dye and uh, here uh, markers which um, have also uh, quite hydrophobically uh, stuck to uh, Kumasi dye. Um, by the way, if you want to try blue native electrophoresis, uh, an easy way would be to test a server gel, start the kit with this uh, ordering number, and uh, you can step right away into this technique if you like. So this is what I wanted to tell you. We need it for the basics a little bit longer than usually. We, our webinars are just half an hour, but this to explain all these basics in an appropriate way, we need a longer time. And I'm now thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions.